So second sort of question I'm going to ask you at the tables, this will be the sort of last of this phase of questions. Um, what is learning? Um, and I, you know, I, I don't want to dump a definition on you, um, but whenever we investigate terms, we're going to look at a number of terms like deep learning, like surface learning, like visual learning, um, haptic learning, kinesthetic learning, and so on. Um, mobile learning, e-learning is a, is a big one. You're, uh, you're e several e-learning practitioners here. So again, back to your neighbors briefly. Just <coughs> what is learning? What does the term mean to you? Yeah. Right. Um, just I, I picked up some, some sort of key words as I, was, as I was walking around. So, you know, learning as knowledge, I think, was one of the things that, that was picked up. Learning as the process of acquiring knowledge, contextualizing it, personalizing it, so making it your own. I thought that the kind of creativity as well, I mean, basically, the idea that you have master something that you've acquired yeah. the knowledge you've understood it and now you're able to actually uh, play with it, create with it. Uh-huh. Yeah. I like I I personally think that you know being able to play more effectively or whatever is 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 something that is important about learning. Um there there's a big affective dimension is what you feel about things. Other thoughts about learning? <coughs> We were talking about it in terms of development, so yeah. depending on the knowledge you go into the community. Yeah. Oops. What happened there? That list of the one that occurs to me is being able to make safe mistakes. I always think we learn by our mistakes. Mm. Um, and in the learning environment, we should be able to ask a stupid question. <laughs> Yeah, I remember some uh, hydrogen sulfide training people did. Where you didn't really want to do it in the real world. You'd like to do it in a simulation rather than... Anyway, yeah. Um, to make safe mistakes. Um, from helicopters underwater. It's a yeah. Good <laughs> the la last time I was at Robert Gordon's university was more than 15 years ago. I was working with somebody from Robert Gordon's on a project in Azerbaijan, and we came up here and for what I'm not quite sure because it wasn't anything to do with what we were doing. I think they just installed the great big swimming pool with a pretend helicopter that turns over, and we watched people escape from the helicopter in the swimming pool. And it was sort of discussions about to what extent this did really simulate the conditions under which you would have to really get out of a real helicopter. But yes, um, that, was, that was interesting. Definitions of learning without going into, I, th I think most of what you were talking about comes into these categories. Definitions of learning tend to break down into two. Learning as process, learning as something you do or learning as product or outcome, learning as something that you have. And an awful lot of higher education, indeed education policy in general, has focused on the second one. How are we going to deliver learning? The concept of being able to deliver learning as opposed to how are we able to facilitate the process of other people learning? And those, that, that sort of divide becomes quite fundamental and interesting. We'll do some, we'll sort of play around with that divide a little bit. Um, the thing that I like uh, quite a lot is learning as a, as change. Learning as a change in state somehow. Um, building possibly on what you've known before, the, the idea, I think you used the word development. That learning is somehow, you know, that Whatever you've done, you are different afterwards. You either have a new skill, a skill that you didn't have. You have new elements of knowledge, new facts, if you, if you want, that, that you didn't have before. You have new understandings, new ways of experiencing the world. And then there's the sort of the last bit, for, particularly for Delta people, anybody, that learning can also be a subject of inquiry in its own right. And often these... Uh, educational development workshops involve people in sort of stepping outside of their disciplinary comfort zone and actually acquiring the language of a different discipline. You may be 
petroleum accountant, and you'll know the theory and practice of petroleum accounting, uh, or you'll be an engineer, or you'll be law, and you'll, you'll be comfortable with the language of your discipline. And then all of a sudden you get into the language of learning and teaching, and it's like, you know, they're speaking up something different. They're, they're, you know, it's an alien tongue. There's a new set of theories, there's a new set of uh, acronyms, new jargon. So learning is, if you like, a subject of study in its own right. There is difference. Um, that for me is, I guess, perhaps the most useful thing that, almost the most useful thing I can communicate today. You can all go home now. Um, <laughs> People learn differently, there is difference, and when I first started off in teaching, um, I, I lectured briefly at Temple University in Philadelphia, and then uh, became an adult community education learner, mostly work, uh, tutor, working with adults returning to learn. And the, the way I characterized my role to myself was that I tried to emulate what I thought the ideal learner was, and then I would make the subject understandable to me, and I would uh, unfold it in the way that I would ideally learn it. And I spent quite a few years doing it that way, and you know, not, it's not an entirely wrong way of doing things, but after a while you start sort of either butting heads with students, or especially um, adult learners who are significantly older than you, and, um, and you find out that well, actually, the model that I have of a learner that is based on my own personal learning experience isn't necessarily the way that other people learn. My goodness, this person learns, they, they, they think about things completely different from me. And then um, having that sort of moment of sort of awakening almost that, you know, if I just keep modeling my own practice, I'm going to be losing half of you. So, a little bit of uh, sort of light theory on learning. Martin and Salio started looking at qualitative differences in learning, and they came up with a very simple deep and surface learning. Deep, are these terms that have, uh, have, have you heard of deep learning and surface learning? I mean, it's, 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 you know, very, very simplistic, I guess. But surface learning, rote learning or memorization, deep learning, learning with understanding. Um, without wanting to um, disparage a lot of people in starting off on learning and teaching as a subject of inquiry in its own right, will sort of pick these up and say, well, you know, my job is to turn people from surface learners into deep learners. And actually, that oversimplifies this even even this simplistic construct. Because, of course, we need to memorize some things sometimes, um, whether it be your times tables, whether it be French grammar, whether it be whatever there are. There are times when a surface approach is entirely appropriate. And there are often, without the surface, you can never get to the depth underneath it. So I'm not going to disparage surface learning, and I'm not going to say, that you, know, you need to get beyond it. We'll even do a little bit of surface learning today. I mean, to some extent, that's what we're doing now. Um, there's a couple of examples that I gave. So I just read it through a second time very slowly. Sometimes I would read it aloud. It was much easier to understand. I think actually this time I understood what they were talking about rather than just made up what they were talking about by making references back to it. I, the Martin and Salyu are trying to illustrate a, a sort of a deeper approach to learning, somebody that's um, actually trying to learn it rather than just to memorize it. Uh, and in contrast, I guess, um, there'll be a topic in the book you hunt through the section, see if they've got any. Hopefully, they'll have the exact question. You can copy down the answer. Um, a, a much more uh, surface approach. You apply that to the problem. The intention to cope minimally with course requirements, 
the looking to the teacher for the right answer. Just tell me what the right answer is. I'll write it down on the exam. I'll go away. We'll all be happy, OK? Um, that, that kind of thing. Um, often finding new ideas challenging. However, um, these and other approaches, and we'll talk about a few more approaches, they describe intentions and processes in relation to tasks. And they vary between contexts. So often you'll hear, oh, I'm a surface learner, me. Don't bother me with the theory. I just want to know what the facts are. And you know, we'll, we'll be done, all right? Um, people will self-identify sometimes as a type of learner. Um, you know, oh, me, I'm a deep learner. Well, no, these and other approaches tend not to be innate, not to be fixed. They're not labels for individuals. And you will deploy different strategies at different times. Um, we've all probably, you know, when we, you know, even if it was only back when we were undergraduates, um, go and, you know, just tactically, you've got to get through the exam. You know, didn't do the reading this week. Sorry. Okay, I'm just going to cram it and be done with it. Um, there are all sorts of reasons why you might take different approaches, and I'm not trying to sort of hammer them out of you. Um, James Atherton talks about strategic learning, in which learning becomes a game, in which the, uh, the goal, if you like, is to get a good grade. Um, so gaming learning, learning constructed as a game, acquisition of techniques improves performance. But insofar as uh, learning is not a game, as James said, learning and teaching um, is, uh, is more complex than that. And I think we've already seen some of the complexity behind learning. Um, just briefly back to the agenda, um, um, I said before the workshop, try to read. I've given some reading and then briefly review three online sources. And one of them is James's Learning and Teaching Angles on Learning. Um, so if you have a look at the, the, sort of the, the second of the web references, you can get you dive very deeply into a lot of uh, theories of learning and teaching, and always with James's particular take on things. Um, but it, it's a very useful, a useful resource if you want to explore um, ideas about learning and teaching. And then James illustrates the um, sort of gaming of learning. The lecturer told us his marking scheme, 16 out of possible 20 marks went for design, building, and performance of the bridge. Model bridge, only four marks, 20% were uh, available for the report. So I just decided I'm, not, I'm just going to pass this. You know, I, so I didn't bother with that. So you have to sometimes watch out. And Greg will talk about this, about sort of designing your assessment scheme. And, and sometimes we inadvertently um, undercut our own, our own um, uh, aims. So I remember sort of saying, well, if we want people to participate, we need to give them some marks for it. I know, we'll make 5% mark for participation. And the students say, 5%? Ah, I can deal with a 60. Don't worry about it, or whatever. And they actually you know, get signaled that that isn't you know, we think we're making it important by giving some marks to it, and they sort of see five as being, you know, a very low percentage of significance. So in trying to give it significance, we actually inadvertently take significance away from it from some learners. So it's, it's a tricky balance to strike. You want to signal high expectations to people. You want them to know how they can get better marks, but sometimes we uh, undercut our own ambition by um, signaling something as being insignificant when we thought what we were doing was signaling it as being significant. Um, so all that said, nonetheless, we do see that there are specific ability or, or specific preferences, if you like. Verbal comprehension, word fluency, number facility, spatial visualization. All of these things do vary from person to person. You won't find everybody gets a high score in all of these areas. It goes back to 1938 um, and then recapitulated and much used um, the idea that some people are visual learners, some people are um, you know, auditory learners, some people prefer to read and write. 
Um, there are different approaches to learning. Um, the concept that preferences and abilities are closely tied is open to challenge. We can learn to be good at things that we might not initially have been good at. And we're not going to do it today, but one of the exercises sometimes you can do, you may have heard of the VAK or VARK, visual, auditory, kinesthetic learning uh, typologies, very simple typologies. And I find if I do one in the morning and the afternoon, I'll come out quite different. Um, there are times of day when things are changed. Uh, anybody here with a psychology background? Oh, good, I can say anything I like. <laughs> no, um, psychometric testing um, often depends on the time of day that it's administered. People come out differently at different times of the day. Have a good lunch, you sort of kind of sit back and me, I'm just kind of all ears now. Um, so there's, there are variations that relate not just to who you are, but it, that relate to when you are and when you're doing these things. Um, so. For example, after lunch today, I'm going to make you do work and not do too much talking. Um, so, yeah. Other, other approaches. Um, so we've talked about, uh, very briefly touched on deep and surface, very briefly touched on uh, learning preferences around spatial, visual, auditory learning. Um, Steven Pinker talks about a foundational epistemic divide, an absolutely fundamental divide between people. There are those people, according to Pinker, and I sort of buy it, who prefer to go from the specific to the general. They, they want to f experiment with things. They want to get things, um, you know, try something out before they're told what the theory is, if you like. Don't explain it to me until I've you know, got my hands dirty. Um, the, the concept of theory building um, from the specific to the general, the inductive approach. And the other side, <coughs> the deductive approach. And again, when I say that there is this and there is that, of course I also mean there's a continuum between them. I don't mean them to necessarily be mutually exclusive, but you will find there are some people in your classes who really cannot grasp the task until they've been told what the rules are, until they've gone from the general to the specific. They, they want to know what the, what the rules are, what the theory is. Ah, oh, okay, now I know, now I can go and, you know, get down to it. The biggest illustration of the differences here is the change in the medical profession starting in the late 60s, early 70s. The medical profession moved from pretty much a deductive approach to teaching. You, this is training of doctors. You spend the first three years of an undergraduate medicine degree doing anatomy, physiology, uh, biology, my, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, learning all of the theories before you're turned loose on the wards with patients. The medicine curriculum has turned around to being an almost entirely problem-based approach to learning and teaching, moved from a deductive to an inductive approach. In the first year of training, most doctors now, they are in the wards taking cases and diagnosing patients. Okay, not, you know, the simulation say failure. Obviously, their diagnoses don't necessarily, aren't necessarily the ones that are acted upon, but at the very first day of medical training, it's like, there's a patient, take a history, okay, what do you think? <laughs> oh, I have no idea, I don't know how the body works, ah, no, what do you think? And so, sort of pushing people to um, come up with an understanding of the, sort of, if you like, the whole person. By the end of the curriculum, Yes, the theories are built. They don't go without the um, basic knowledge and theories of medicine, but the direction of teaching has changed radically. Engineering has made some attempts to go in this direction, uh, to take a more problem-based approach to the teaching of engineering, but has been more sort of conservative. University of Eindhoven in the Netherlands has gone quite a lot towards problem-based curricula in engineering. Uh, engineering tends to pick up little bits of problem-based learning, but hasn't re-engineered re the whole curriculum around a um, 
a deductive, uh, uh, an inductive approach. Um, Pinker says that people in your class will split somewhere along these lines. And it won't be like half of your class is one and half of your class is another. And there will be some disciplinary differences. But you will find there are some people who prefer to read the book from the front to the back, start with the table of contents and go that way through it. There are other people who will prefer to read the book from the back to the front, turn straight to the index, find what I need to know. Oh, that's interesting. That relates to that. End up putting it together in a very different way. As a teacher, one of the things that you're going to have to deal with is people who learn in different sequences. Because you only have one class, one session. You can only, you know, time, without being too philosophical about it, tends to run in one direction. Um, and you know you do this, and then you do this, and then you do that. And that's going to work for some of the people, whichever direction you choose to take. But it won't work for everybody else. How are you going to provide the inductivist, if you like, with a way in if you are teaching primarily in a deductive way? Okay, that that be sort of a fundamental question that you're going to have. Oh, it's starting to turn to snow. Excellent. Um, okay. So direction of, direction of learning is quite significant. Um, so just a brief summary, the things that I've spoken about, the things that we've talked about, learning as process or product, deep service and strategic learning, learning preferences, and learning direction. All of these things are fundamental um, indications of difference in learners. And how you address those will depend to some extent on what your own preference is. So you're going to obviously go with your preferred style. But don't think that your preferred style is necessarily the preferred style of everybody else out there. <laughs>